This week, we'll take a close look at the many ways in which plants have adapted to their particular and sometimes peculiar habitats in New England. But first, let's remind ourselves of what the term adaptation really means and the mechanisms by which plants actually adapt. The traditional way we think of adaptation is in terms of natural selection, and Charles Darwin was the go-to guy for that theory, although he certainly had help from many colleagues, including Alfred Russell Wallace, a biologist studying organisms half a world away from Darwin's patrician home in England. Wallace was toiling in the jungles of the Asia Pacific, and it's said that he came up with his own independent theory of evolution while in the throes of malaria or some other tropical fever. But when we think of plant adaptation, we probably first think of Darwin because that's who we were taught about in school, and also because of his fascinating studies of plants, in particular carnivorous plants and orchids. And no, you don't have to have a white beard in order to be a great botanist. Plants and other organisms adapt evolutionarily by passing genes from one generation to the next. Most simply put, the plants in a population that can survive particular environmental challenges live on to convey their genetic material to the next generation, whereas plants less well adapted die before reproducing. By that means, succeeding generations of plants become increasingly successful at weathering the slings and arrows that the environment flings at them. But sometimes, plants that have become too specialized for a particular habitat or lifestyle can find themselves in a bit of an evolutionary dead end when conditions change. For example, a well-circulated theory in botany is that plants that have specialized in the ability to self-fertilize lose genetic diversity over time. And plants may have good reason to self-fertilize. They can continue to reproduce when pollinators and other mechanisms to help them outcross with other plants are lacking. But if you're mating with yourself over multiple generations, it's easy to see why genetic diversity in a population can erode. And that's why many plants, like this geranium, have evolved ways to avoid self-fertilization. It's genetic diversity, a large collection of genes in a population, and hence a lot of physical variability among plants, that enables evolution to take place. If environmental conditions, or so-called selection pressures, change, it may be the weird mutated plants in a population that are the ones that can survive. So that's the conventional view of evolution that has persisted robustly over more than a century. We employ the principles of evolution every time we create a new cultivar of a crop or ornamental plant by selecting for the lines that perform well in particular situations. Natural selection weeds out, oh, bad pun, the plants <clears throat> that cannot survive and favors those that can pass their genes on to a new generation. The workings of evolution are particularly intriguing when we realize that disparate, unrelated plants growing in similar challenging environmental conditions have evolved similar adaptive solutions. We'll see examples of this later this week. This phenomenon is known as convergent evolution, and I became especially attuned to this in my own research on mangroves. So let's step away from New England, just briefly, to enjoy a short Caribbean vacation. The term mangrove refers to a suite of about 75 species of plants in wildly different plant families that have adjusted to life on tropical coastlines. Here, these trees, shrubs, palms, and in a couple of cases, even ferns, encounter salty tides and hot conditions that would test the metal of any plant. Yet, most species of mangroves have evolved similar ways of coping. For example, leaves with thick cuticles that can serve water in their tissues, even as a warm tropical sun would evaporate it away. And the capacity via leaf glands to excrete the salts that can poison photosynthetic pathways, or alternatively, to exclude salts at the root. This black mangrove, Avicennia germinans, exudes so much salt during the day, you can lick the leaf and taste it. Mangroves also have 
some pretty crazy roots that grow above the ground or water surface, richly endowed with pores that allow oxygen to pass into them to counteract the effects of oxygen-depleted soils. And those roots hold oxygen in a special tissue called spongy orenchyma. Many mangroves also exhibit a strange mode of reproduction, which involves provisioning seeds so much that they actually germinate precociously on the mother plant. This is called vivipary, from the Latin for live and birth, and it's not especially common in the plant world. I discovered in my own research that mother plants across four different genera of mangroves shield their growing embryos from the hormones that are usually necessary to cope with salt. Maternal tissues have unusually high levels of these hormones, but these same hormones would usually be responsible for making seeds go dormant, and such hormones in such large amounts might never allow the seeds to germinate. So the hormone-shielded seeds sprout on the mother tree, and some newly germinated embryos can grow to prodigious sizes, even a meter long, and can float for enormous distances, even thousands of miles, before they finally root. So you see in this way that evolution is a series of trade-offs, adapt to cope with one environmental challenge, and it has repercussions for many other traits that the plants exhibit. Convergent evolution is a clue to understanding how different plant species evolve, but the story about mangroves also points to another mechanism by which plants can control the success of the next generation. Maternal effects. Mama plants contribute to the genome of baby plants via the normal way, passing half their genes on through sexual reproduction. Those genes combine with those contributed by the papa plant but they also contribute the genes that influence the endosperm, the tissue that provides nutrition to the growing embryo. The mother plant sends all sorts of signals to the developing embryo about conditions for germination and when it should go dormant, etc. And although maternal effects are basically a form of what's called phenotypic plasticity, that is, short-term signals that influence how a plant responds flexibly to its environment, maternal effects are also shaped by evolution. Short-term responses to the environment also shape the way in which genes act on the phenotype, or the outward appearance and behavior of a plant. We understand that genes are not the static entities we thought were passed on to the next generation without modification. Oh, we always knew that genes could mutate, that is, have some of their DNA altered by accidents of replication or by exposure to mutagens such as chemicals or x-rays. But what's becoming clear is that the environment acts on genes continuously, not just on plants, but on ourselves. And it's research with mutated plants, such as these Arabidopsis seedlings, that's been very useful for determining which genes control particular traits. Environmental conditions can also influence the ways in which a methyl group, or a molecule consisting of a variant of methane, CH3, attaches itself to a DNA molecule, such as one of the major amino acids, like cytosine. The process of that attachment, called methylation, has the capacity to deactivate the replication of a gene or its chemical activity and ability to influence protein production in a plant. If a gene is prevented from acting or being functional when it's passed on in the germline of a plant, a mutation has occurred which will potentially be passed on to the next generation of plants. Also, methylation can affect the activity of so-called jumping genes, or transposons, which also alter gene expression. These jumping genes were first discovered by a botanical geneticist, Barbara McClintock, too early in the evolution of science to really understand what she was talking about, but which much later during her lifetime were recognized as important signalers and regulators within a cell. Now, these short-term gene responses, which ultimately can be inherited, are not the same as some instantaneously inherited adaptations. The scientist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck erroneously promulgated the theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics, the idea that organisms could pass down 
adaptations they acquired during their lifetimes. Take the giraffe, for example. Um, that's the one on the right, who has stretched its neck ever and ever taller over its lifetime to be able to nibble those leaves at the very top of an acacia tree. Does its longer neck then get transferred to its offspring? Not instantaneously. It'll have to take many generations of the same types of selection pressures for these types of characteristics to evolve. The huge number of heritable gene changes that would be involved is enormous. And even if they were, would simple methylation be involved? But we are beginning to realize that even small changes to the genome experienced during our lifetime, or that of a plant, can alter the genes we put into the great lottery of life called evolution. And some of the very best insights into evolution and genetics have come from studies of plants.